Right, okay, folks, back again. Another video podcast, two in a row, so we're doing okay. Um, before we jump into anything, I just uh, just want to make a quick note to everyone that so I got a bit of pushback from the from the last episode, um, mainly psychotherapist, psychologist emailing me and saying, you know, that Tom's view of of things in the last episode too simplistic, too bias, cherry picking statistics, things like that, um, and that's fine. But it's sort of it's no good just telling me an email because you're only sort of fighting to convince one person. It'd be much better if you guys that disagree with people that appear on these episodes, if you'd say, well, you know, let me come on the podcast and give my side so we can, you know, get an argument from, from both perspectives. Because like I say, it's no good argue, you know, convincing me. There's thousands of people out here listening and those are the guys that we need to be convincing. Um, so anyway... Speaking of, of of being convinced about things, so we're we're revisiting a topic today. I think it's the first time we've done that. Uh, we're revisiting the topic of stigma, and stigma is one of those aspects of of, of mental health that I've not quite made my mind up on yet. With with a lot of things in mental health, I've I've felt, formed a fairly cohesive opinion about certain things that I could articulate quite well. I like to think. But stigma is one of those things that's I'm finding it very tricky. And I think it's because in, in the first episode we did with Professor Graham Thornacroft, which, um, oh, Sir Professor Graham Thornacroft now, he's been knighted since the episode. Some may say because of the episode. I don't know who'd say that. Um, but he put forth a very convincing opinion. And then we had um, a guy called DJ Jaffe on later on, who was sort of sceptical of of mainstream anti-stigma campaigns but he put forth a very convincing argument as well so hopefully today's guest can help maybe sway me one way or the other um, and put a bit of bit more bit more meat on the bones of, uh, of, of this argument so my guest today is Professor Patrick Corrigan. Patrick is Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, where his research examines psychiatric disability and social disadvantage. He is Principal Investigator of both the National Consortium for Stigma and Empowerment, um, a collaboration of investigators and advocates for more than a dozen institutions, and the Chicago Health Disparity Center, examining how ethnic and income disparities further lessen the opportunities of those with serious mental illness. Pat has written more than 400 peer-reviewed articles. He is the editor emeritus of the American Journal, uh, the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation, the editor of the American Psychiatric Association's journal Stigma and Health, and he's authored or edited 17 books, including the book which forms the basis of today's discussion, which is The Stigma Effect, um, Unintended Consequences of Mental Health Campaigns. That's this one here. Anybody watching? So, Pat, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Danny. Thanks for having me. Okay, so as always... Um, well, what I'll say is, because we've already done stigma for a quite a long episode, I think we did about an hour and a half on it before with, with Professor Graham Thornacroft, and that touches on stigma. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good beginner's guide to stigma and, and discrimination in mental health. So I'd say for, for that, so that we can sort of jump into what your book's about specifically, I'd say to the listeners, go back to that episode and listen to that one first, maybe, um, so that... Uh, because we're only just gonna we're gonna skim over some of that today and give a, a brief introduction before we get into the thick of it. But like I say, however, I always like to start these interviews by asking the the person I'm speaking to, what was it that brought you into into psychology in the first place, and why work on stigma in particular? What brought me into psychology in the first place is this idea in mental health of wounded um, wounded healer, and that's probably me. I think a lot of people might go into mental health because of their own mental health challenges. Um, I had a, I was actually in medical school, had a hard time in medical school, had a hard time getting to graduate school, and wanted to help other people with these kind of challenges of anxiety, depression, and the like. Um, my other hat is I'm what's known as a rehab psychologist, so my goal is to help people with serious mental illness get back meet their their work goals, get back to work, um, get through school, 
learn how to live independently, have meaningful relationships. And after working many years in that, I realized one of the reasons why people can't get back to work is not because of their symptoms, but because employers won't hire people known as mentally ill or landlords won't rent to them or teachers don't want them around. So I sort of fell into the stigma area um, looking at instead, if I might loosely say, instead of looking at the sick, and I don't like the way I'm putting this, but instead of looking at the sick person, I'm looking at the sick society. Instead of trying to fix the person, I'm trying to fix society so people with mental illness have more opportunities and can meet the goals they deserve. So, I mean, you've, uh, you've spoken about this publicly. Um, that your uh, your personal experience with with mental health issues. So you've had diagnoses of um, bipolar disorder, panic disorder, generalized anxiety. I think depression as well. Um, from that perspective, have, did you experience st- any stigma of your own ju- at the time you were were dealing with these, or maybe these are ongoing? I, I, I don't know. So um, the. To be a professor for about 10 seconds, I would say there's two types of stigma. Public stigma is what happens, what the public does to people with mental illness um, when they know you have the label. So did I experience public stigma? Um, And self-stigma is what did you do to yourself? Do you feel ashamed of yourself? Public stigma, probably not directly, because like a lot of people with mental illness, I didn't tell anyone. Um... I would say indirectly, uh, my first job was in a medical school in a psychiatry department, which is an atmosphere of a disease model and focusing a lot on symptoms and um, dysfunctions. And so my first 14 years in a psychiatry department, I would never tell anybody. Um, I didn't even think about telling anybody. It was just, you know, something, some part of me I needed to deny. Um, And so I would think, if stigma ever had an effect on me, it would be this denial sort of thing. Not me. No, no, I'm not one of those guys. Um, both from the strategic point is I didn't want to get in trouble. And from the self point is it took more maturity for me to realize I was in that group and to accept it, to be proud of it. What do you mean when you say you didn't want to, wouldn't want to get in trouble? Oh, I didn't want to come out. Um, I was at the University of Chicago Medical School in the psychiatry department. I didn't want people there to know I had mental illness. Um, in fact, even now I'm a little hesitant because then people are going to say, you know, like DJ Jaffe, who I know well, is going to say, you know, you just have an axe to grind. You're trying to support yourself. Um, by the way, you're nuts. Who can believe any of your research? You're probably not capable of doing good research. It would, it would diminish my view of research. Um, people, you know, you have the mental illness label on your forehead. It makes mental health providers in particular take a second look at you. And I can tell you to this day, um, I do a lot of public speaking. Speaking to medical schools is hard for me because, uh, again, I just think, I mean, I worked in a medical school. I know this kind of framing somebody with that label and the effect it can have on yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that part that in in within the profession it seems especially acute. So of all the all the people I've interviewed so far, you know, more than seventy people so far, I've only had one person before who was sort of open about it. Um, a psychiatrist called Linda Gask. She's very open about her experience with with depression. Um, she felt the same sort of pressures, but with with. The like we spoke a little bit, you know, for a few minutes before we started recording, um, and then sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll speak to people after the recording's over. I've had quite a few people tell me that the same thing as you said, like when I asked them at the beginning, "Why did you get into this?" and the and there's a very sort of a, a dry academic answer, and then they'll say later on, you know, well, actually, you know, I've got personal experience with it, but I can't tell anybody because you know that'd be that'd be a terrible thing to do in 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 this profession, and. I find that really sort of counterintuitive and 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 really bizarre. What do? Why why is that a problem? Well, again, um, to assure people there are data behind what we're saying. This is not just opinion. Data quite consistently says the most stigmatizing profession amongst plumbers and lawyers and electricians is psychiatrists. 
Um, and the second most stigmatizing profession is psychologists. And the reason I think, especially for psychiatry, is they see people only when they're sick and when they're acutely ill and they're not making sense and they're hard to talk to. And when they get better, they go away. And so our, we sort of limit our understanding of people with mental illness in terms of this bizarre, overwhelming behavior, which we realize that's just a small portion of the entire picture. I mean, one way to look at it uh, is if we understood black people as violent, because the only time I see back black people is when they're on the newspaper and they're shooting people. It, it limits our perspective of the wholeness and diversity of an individual. Yeah, but part of me, I wonder if it's got something to do with the idea that if you're if you're treating people for for mental illness, then in order to be qualified to bring somebody back to normality, you need to be sort of um, you know inoculated from it, not the sort of person that that comes down with with mental illness. You need to be you need to be normal in order to help people get back to normality. And if you can't, and if you're not, then, you know, if, if you're struggling with mental illness, then, you know, what the, how the hell are you supposed to help me? Because you obviously I, I can't solve it for yourself. I don't know, maybe maybe it's something to do that. I don't know if I'm just sort of speculating I guess there. This is, this is why I'm glad I worked in a medical school for as long as I did, because I think we need to be aware of what society expects of these folks. Um, society expects psychiatrists and psychologists to sort of be the guardian of normal because abnormal stuff is scary. Um, it doesn't always happen, but abnormal stuff can escalate into violence. And so we expect the person with psychiatrists to step in and help the person in a, psychi in a, in a psychotic episode, learn to manage it so that it doesn't escalate and to do something bad. And the profession meant to do that. They're meant to assert their authority. And I think in limited situations, that's good. But in extremely limited situations. Um, in fact, the average person with psychosis might be psychotic, you know, a small percent of the time. The rest of the time, they're living like the rest of us, and they need to learn how to live with it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so time sensitive let's jump into this because we do need to for people even though i've recommended it people are going to be like oh, i'm not going back to listening to the other episode I'll, i'm just going to listen okay this one. so i'm going to ask you a question I can't oh, okay help me. okay what did dj jaffe say that made you turn against graham by the way it's a small world i know graham well i know of dj jaffe oh no I, I, it's not that I, it's not that i turned against graham's opinion it's just that um it's i think a lot of what a lot of the stuff that like Graham was talking about was it's it's very intuitive information. And to be fair to Graham, you know, obviously I know he knows his stuff. Um, he was he was one of those people that was an absolute nightmare to do the research on because it was so much of it. And where do you start? Because the guy's got so much uh, research in you know it, as part of his career. But a lot of it because it was sort of a, it was the first time we touched on stigma, and it was sort of a beginner's guide. A lot of it was very intuitive. And then DJ Jaffe came along with arguments that were very counterintuitive. And, but a lot of the statistics to back it up. I mean, I've got to say that when I read uh, DJ's book, it's one of, and again, I'm not a researcher. I'm, I'm, I'm just a lay person. But I would say DJ's book is one of the most well-researched books I've ever read. And, so, and a lot of the statistics that he put in the, um, you know, in the appendix to the book were really, really interesting, really sort of fascinating reading. And, but I couldn't find anywhere that he twisted the, the numbers in, 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 in his favor or anything. It was, it all seemed very concrete. Um, but we'll, we'll, well, if we put DJ. <laughs> To, to to on the back burner for the moment because he will be coming up again. Some of the some of the information specifically that he to told me will be coming up again later on, uh, and it's that stuff that I'd um, be interested to hear you sort of push back against. Um, but if we could, like I say, if we could just sort of start with some basic definitions because it's not it, it, the word stigma is it, it's sort of a, it's more of a foundation stone. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of offshoots that are sort of related to it. Um, so if we could start with 
the, the three terms that come up a lot are stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. And I think some people will will struggle to untangle um, the distinction between those three. So if we could start with that, please, Pat. So you mean stereotype prejudice and discrimination, right? You said stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. Well, just I'll, all, right. all four, if so you like. I think for your listeners, for your viewers, um, I think there's some metaphors that, to me, make a lot of sense. Um, the stigma of mental illness is the same category as racism, sexism, and ageism, um, except for one big difference, which is if I'm in a room with 100 people, I probably can tell who belongs in a racial group that's different than me, um, people of color, who belongs in a gender group different than me, women, um, who belongs in the ageist group with me, old people. Um, you cannot tell in a group of 100 people who has a mental illness. So in some ways, I think one of the ways to understand the stigma of mental illness is, is think about the stigma of being gay or lesbian. Now, let me say right away, in no ways am I trying to say gay and lesbian are mentally ill. In fact, of the many things psychiatry did, that's one of the more egregious. However, the essence, one of the essence of being gay is that it can be hidden. And so one of the challenges of being gay is to come out. So that applies to people with mental illness. So with that windy statement, some people break stigma into stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Stereotypes are the beliefs about a group. Um, all people with mental illness are dangerous or incompetent or chose to be that way. Prejudice is agreeing with the stereotype leading to an emotion. Yep, they're all dangerous, and so I'm afraid of them. And discrimination is a behavior. I won't hire them. I won't rent to them. I won't let them in my school. Okay. And that applies if I'm doing that to you because you have the mark of being black or the mark of being a woman or the mark for mental illness is the label is that somehow I know you're a mentally ill guy. Right. And then, so, and you also sort of um, subdivide stigma into four different types. And you, and you touched upon some before, so like public stigma and then self-stigma. But there was two others that you identified as well that I hadn't stumbled across before. So if you could um, just briefly mention those as well. Wow. I'm going to tell my mother that you actually read the book. I did um, read the book. Of course I did. <laughs> um, so the other two are label avoidance. Um, so I'll go back to what I think fundamentally the stigma of mental illness is. Um, Irving Goffman, who is the Sigmund Freud of stigma, say, uh, of stigma world, the stigma research, says stigma is fundamentally a mark. And so the mark, again, for people of color is different skin color from the white majority or women is different body types or age is having gray hair. Um, the mark for mental illness is the label. And the way you get the label is you're associated with mental health care. Or more succinctly put, I see you coming out of the psychiatrist's office, or I see you coming out of the mental health center, or I sit next to you at work, see you taking some pills as an antidepressant. And so I know Danny is a weak, depressed guy. And the way people deal with that is they try to avoid the label so they won't go get help. And so... The epidemiologic research and the degree to which people with mental illness will not seek help is huge. Uh, somewhere along the line of 50% or more. So whether you're diagnosed with schizophrenia or a more benign disorder like major depression or just a reactive disorder because a loved one passed away, about half the people will never go get help. That's label avoidance. Okay, and then it was, um, uh, was it st structural stigma as well? Structural stigma is more of a, social, uh, a sociological phenomenon. Things get written into the law or into social mores that affect um, opportunities. For example, in the United States, in family law, decisions about um, custody of one's children, um, if you and your partner are getting divorced, your mental health history from 15 years earlier can be brought into court. Um, and... Um, other things like your criminal record perhaps could or could not, but people use your mental health history to um, stop certain opportunities, and these are sort of ingrained in the culture. Right, okay. And then 
finally, I guess, um, the, the big one, and again, we've sort of, sort of touching upon on all these very briefly, but um, the origin of stigma, like the, the, the reason for it in the first place, maybe the, the supposed purpose behind it, um, for, and, and maybe not just from a, a, you know, a sociological perspective, but maybe an evolutionary perspective, anything, anything you, you have to say about that aspect of it. But then more specifically, uh, I was interested in, in, in touching upon this idea of the, the kernel of truth that, that you write about in the book. And, um, th this you'd be pleased to know is where I'm going to bring, um, DJ Jaffe into the equation and, and some of, some of his points for you to sort of push up against. But yeah, more specifically, I'm interested in the, the sort of the, the origins and the, the reasons for stigma against people with, with mental health issues. So we wrote a paper and from whence comes stigma. And there is some evolutionary belief. Um, stigma comes from the pure ability to notice differences between groups of people. And generally, an in-group finds it more advantageous to discriminate against an out-group. So probably the group that all your listeners can relate to is ethnicity. And so white people... Um, perhaps have a social disadvantage in discriminating against black people, um, men against women, old against young. And that might be the perceived evolutionary view. The kernel of truth is an old and largely discredited notion of the fact that um, racial differences are based on a small truth. Um, one I know well is the kernel of truth is that Irishmen are drunken louts who are unable to work is based on the fact that there's a kernel of truth that we Irish drink too much. Right. Kernel of truth is that blacks are um, good at physical things and bad at mental things because anecdotally you can see black people um, are sports people and they are not capable of doing intellectual things. Um, kernel of truth is that men are good at math and women are good at English. Um, but um, the problem with that as a stigma is it dissuades uh, people like Marie Curie from ever pursuing a physics job because as a woman, she shouldn't be good at math. So the problem with kernel of truth is when you actually dig down, first off, it's not the easiest research to do. Um, again, going back to one I know well. How do you actually do research to show that Irishmen are bigger drinkers? Um, that's 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 population research. It's hard to do. Um, the other thing is in doing population research like that, if you start looking at Irish as all drugs, you're likely to see it, even if you can't do the extremely expensive research to prove it. Right. So let me throw some of these at you. So um, I'd say generally the 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 two the two biggest sort of um, prejudices that people would have against people with mental illness would be, I think you've already mentioned these, um, incompetence and uh, the, the dangerous, particularly people with um, serious mental illness, that they're, they're dangerous. And from my understanding, you, uh, I think actually you said that the, um, like the kernel of truth doesn't hold up uh, as an argument in, in those instances. Um, and so... This is where, you know, when we, I'll, I'll look at some of the research and I'd be interested to see what you, you have to say about it because, I mean, some of this is pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, so I'm going to read out some statistics now for the, the uh, fr from studies uh, for, the, for the listeners. Um, so it comes to bipolar disorder. So um, bipolar, people with bipolar disorder um, of 8.4%. Um, guilty of committing a violent crime versus 3.5% of the general population. Uh, Sina Faisal, 2010. Schizophrenia, a Swedish study of 644 individuals with schizophrenia um, followed, a 15, um, followed for 15 years reported that they committed violent offences at a rate four times greater than the general population. A uh, study of 538 individuals with schizophrenia living in London reported that the men had 3.9 times and women a 5.3 times greater risk for conviction of assault and serious violence compared to a control group than other psychiatric diagnoses. 
And then, I mean, we've got a huge one here, study in Finland, an unselected birth cohort of 11,000 individuals was followed for 26 years. Men with schizophrenia without alcoholism um, were, were 3.6 times more likely to commit a violent crime than men without a psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, men with both schizophrenia and, and alcoholism were 25.2 times more likely to commit a violent crime. Um, I've got to say, Patrick, I, I could go on and on with, with statistics around that. Um, and then one of the more one of the more um, severe sort of accusations would be um, the link between serious mental illness and homicide. Um, so there's one here um, in Indiana. Researchers examined the records of 518 individuals in prison who had been convicted of homicide between 1990 and 2002. Um, uh, among the 518, 53 had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, bipolar or some other psychotic disorders. An additional 42 individuals had been diagnosed with mania or major depressive disorder. Um, it, sh it should be emphasised that the study included only those who had been sentenced to prison and do not include those individuals who had committed homicides and were subsequently found to be incompetent to stand trial um, or not guilty by reason of insanity and therefore sent to psychiatric facility instead of prison. Um, thus, um, the... Uh, 10.2%, which is, um, sorry, among the 518, 53% have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. That's 10.2%. 10.2% um, is an undercount. Um, at least 10% of males with severe mental illness became violent, um, and a, a, a less percentage of females do. In the United States, this would total approximately 200,000 to 250,000 individuals if you extrapolate those, those statistics. Um, those are fairly damning statistics, um, one of the, the, the interesting distinctions that DJ Jaffe makes, a lot of people in the uh, in, in mental health um, anti-stigma campaigns say that people with uh, serious mental illness are no more violent than the general population. In fact, they're more likely to be victims of, of violent offences. And that's true, but apparently when you talk about un people with untreated serious mental illness, then they, in general, are more violent than than the general population. So I'd just like you to sort of tear into that if you if you would please. Did you say tear into it? Yes. Tear is a good verb. <laughs> <clears throat> um this is pretty much the mantra of the treatment advocacy center from which he comes. Um he once said and I'm paraphrasing and I can find the quote if you want, um, it may not be right or wrong, but the way you get um legislators uh, attention on uh, mental health issues is to stress the violence. Um, the tr I do not know his book. Um, I know the Treatment Advocacy Center in general has been critiqued for the quality and the way they glean data. So here's the problem for your viewers is on one hand, you got all these compelling studies. On another hand, I'm going to quote some studies, mm -hmm. and they're going to figure out who's right. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's um, the bane of my existence, that part, is trying to, trying to do that. <laughs> so I think one of the issues I would say about his studies is they are all small data samples. And because they're small data samples, um, they're likely to lead to conclusions that don't generalize to the population. The way the National Institutes of Health deal with that in the United States, and I would imagine similar bodies in the UK and the EU, is they do large population studies where they don't look for biased samples. They go out on the street and stop people and get information from them and find out the degree to which um, these things occur. And it's this epidemiologic research that, for example, leads to the pretty solid finding that schizophrenia is one per, um, eight tenths of one percent of the population. So, what does the epidemiologic research show? Well, to be, just, just, to, just to jump in there, sorry, Pat. To be fair, I mean, um, you know, I, I'd I'd agree a lot. A lot of the studies you come across, that I mean, yeah, I read studies sometimes with a sample size of like fifteen people, but you know, these ones here that I've quoted, you know, six hundred and forty-four, five hundred and thirty-eight, and then the finished study was eleven thousand. I mean, that's pretty. So epidemiologic research is twenty to thirty thousand people. Right. That's first. It's uh, the finished study is compelling. I would have to see that. It's hard for me to question that. Um, the other samples are purposive. He's picking groups of people to answer a question. Epidemiologic research is people off the streets 
randomly and laboriously selected to be representative of the population. He would be glad to know, and perhaps you, that in fact people with schizophrenia are more dangerous than other folks. But, but that's How, the ever. distinction is it's untreated though, isn't it? And the untreated is such a slippery slope because it suggests that if you treated these guys, they wouldn't be dangerous, which leads to um, coercive sort of interventions because after all, a person with schizophrenia can't decide for themselves anyway to force them to take their medication. Right. Let me go back to... Um, people with schizophrenia, whether they're treated or not, are about four times more likely to be dangerous than the rest of the population, according to epidemiologic catchment area studies, as well as the national comorbidity studies, which are funded by NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health. Something to keep in mind, a study that we published, um, is if you go back and look at this data and try, look in a group of 100 people, what is the best predictor of violence? It is not mental illness. In a group of 100 people, the best predictor of violence is being a man. Yes. Being a male is likely to be better predictive than schizophrenia about fourfold. Being a young man raises it to eightfold. And being a minority young man raises it to twelvefold. So if I did a prophylactic policy whereby I want to save violence in the United States, I'm likely to be more successful if I interview with young black men than I am people with mental illness. Right, okay. Um, That's the first one. Here's the second one to share with you. Yep. Is, um, I end up on the radio a lot after these god-awful shootings that occur in the United States. And so people like DJ Jaffe are likely to say that's untreated med uh, treated mental illness. That if, if people like Adam Lanza and Jared Kushner, not Jared Kushner, that's an interesting slip, Jared Luffner and <laughs> um, James Woods were all treated, they wouldn't have done all these god-awful shootings. The FBI just published a paper that came out um, this year where they reviewed every mass shooting and found mental illness accounted for a very small part of that. Yeah, that well, I can confirm that with um, the the interview I did with Peter Langman on on the idea of school shooters. So yeah, he said the same thing. So I would say that statements like Mr. Jaffe and selecting data the way he selects them is as um, discriminatory and biased as making a similar case about black people, since our jails are full of black people. And tying it to untreated leads to this call for coercive treatments, which is probably one of the biggest problems with the healthcare system. Amongst other things, we talked about why psychiatrists are as hard as they are, because society pushes psychiatrists to have to make these unilateral decisions and force people to take meds, which, by the way, generally, legally, is a very hard thing to do. So then, you know, with with you conceding the point that um, at least on, you know, schizophrenia, that epidemiologically you could argue that those people are more dangerous. Um, I didn't concede that point. <clears throat> I said you need to put in perspective what statistics do, that in large epidemiologic studies, people with schizophrenia will endorse the fact of being violent more than other folks. But if you want a better predictor, Again, there are much better predictors which tie numbers with social policy, which is using social policy to promote stigma. Okay, fair enough. But I think my, my question related to that still stands. It's that um, that you know that to me says that then the when people are saying you know people with serious mental illness are more dangerous, then that that does support a kernel of truth. Yet you still argue that it doesn't, and I'm just wondering. Why, why that would be the case? Well, the other problem, the essence of what a stigma is and kernel of truth is generalizing from a population data to an individual. And uh, again, in the paper that we did, I'd be glad to provide the site to you. The level of uh, false positives is on the, fo on the order of, of 80%. So if you use a statistic, you're likely to be wrong 80% of the time when you talk to somebody with schizophrenia. Right. Um, two other things about somebody with schizophrenia. Um, 
is people with schizophrenia are more violent, A, when they're using substances. Yep. But so is everybody watching this this tape. <laughs> That's true. And B, yeah. when they're more stressed out. Again, so is everybody watching this video. Yes. No, I, totally true. Totally true. Um, so I'm I'm okay with using data, and I'm okay with engaging with Mr. Jaffe on the data, but you need to consider the social policy he's using the data for, and he's trying to promulgate. And again, I think a lot of advocates, a lot of stigma advocates would put it in the same category of trying to justify why so many black people are in jail in the United States. One one of the the other things that I find interesting is the uh, sort of the, the problem of discrimination. So where uh, you know, stigma becomes a prejudice and then prejudice morphs into um, a behavior. So um, one of the most common issues with it is that people refusing to hire somebody um, with, with, with mental illness. And I'm just, on that point, I find the idea of discrimination on that front quite a tricky one. This is something that I, uh, I, I wanted to speak to, to Graham about, but I couldn't really articulate it at the time because I didn't, you know, I, had, I hadn't researched it enough. But um, at least in the UK, I think, you know, small businesses account for something like 99.35 or 3 or 5% of, of all the businesses operating in, in the UK. And then micro businesses that employ between zero and nine people. Um, actually, I think I, I, I jotted these stats down before. Um, or maybe I didn't. No, I didn't. I think, but still, I think they, they account for about 80%. So, it, you know, millions of small businesses and... When it when it comes to things like, um, and I can speak from personal experience on this, I think I, you know I'm going to argue in favour of of this idea of, of of how people are supposed to sort of react to this. So this idea of incompetence. Um, so I mean, just when it you know when it comes to depression, I mean I remember when I was going through it with with my depression and anxiety, I was a pain in the ass for my boss. I was very unreliable, um, very flaky, and and when it was the worst of it, I just wasn't doing my job properly. And um, when you actually look at the, the statistics of it as well, um, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, well, there's malingering, but I'd, I'll leave the malingering issue to, to one side for the moment. Um, but so these are UK statistics. Um, approximately 80% of people with depression supported some, lev some level of functional impairment because of their depression. And I'm sorry, 8 or 80? 80. 80. Eight oh, yeah, eight oh, eight percent of of people with depression reported some level of functional impairment because of their depression, and twenty seven percent reported serious difficulties in work and, and home life. And then again, UK statistics. Apparently, it's uh, and these are from uh, the the UK government's own uh, work related stress um, and anxiety statistics. statistics. Um, it's twenty five point eight um, working days are lost every year. Um, to, to stress depression or anxiety with an average annual cost to the employer of um, two, about two and a half thousand pound. And what you get there is you do get a, a, a picture of people openly admitting, 80% of people admitting that there's a functional impairment with something like depression, which is arguably not a, a serious mental illness, maybe like bipolar schizophrenia, and that there's actual you know, these work days being lost to it and these money being lost at the same time. And my question is what, how are people like employers that, and, that are engaging with people with mental health issues, how are they supposed to actually deal with that? And what's the difference between being discriminatory and just making, a, a, you know, a pragmatic personal or business decision in, in dealing with people? So I think we're conflating... Um depressive experiences with a diagnosis. So are you saying now that because you've been diagnosed as depression, I can use that in a business decision when I want to hire you? No, I'm not saying that you could that you would use it as, um, uh, as a business decision. How else would I know that your depression would get in the way of you not doing a good job? Well, I'm just saying it's because, you know, when, when you look at it statistically, with, I'm, I'm still talking about this idea of kernel of truth. 
And so there seems to be a kernel of truth existing there with the idea of incompetence. You know, if you was if you, if you was if you was an employer with um, a, you know two people CVs in front of you, which by any other metric were exactly the same, but you happen to know that you know person B suffers with depression, it w it wouldn't be unreasonable to to go with person A, or would it? I have to admit, this is one of the most stimulating conversations I've had about stigma. Um, oh, thank you. You're good. I really think you're a very thoughtful person. Um, I try to teach my students about the gap between what numbers say and the policy decisions you make as a result of them. Um, I think you're very good at quoting numbers. I think we need to think about how that translates into a policy. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it's legitimate for an employer not to hire about 35% of the population if they have a diagnosis of depression, regardless of whether they're depressed now. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, saying it's a legitimate decision, Patrick. What I'm saying is um, how are people um, supposed to deal with it? What's a reasonable... What's a reasonable expectation for an employer, for instance, in that situation? So the question is, how does a re employer get educated to handle that sort of situation? Yes, yes. So you know by law, and I understand from people like Graham, I don't know what it's called, but the UK has the equivalent of the Americans with Disabilities Act, that by law... People with disabilities, with depression, are supposed to receive accommodations as long as it does not cause undue hardship on the business. So a disability by itself is not legally okay to exclude someone because we realize that disabilities like, like depression are not a static sort of phenomenon. People kind of come and go. And what's even more bizarre or more perplexing is for the, the difficult behavior that a person diagnosed with depression has, a person, a quote unquote normal person who is depressed can show the same behavior. So I don't think the label by itself leads to a conclusion um, that's very beneficial for the employer. Here's another thing. I've done a lot of supported employment. Um, and the fact is, is that Lots of employees suffer with mental health challenges. If we were to exclude them all, employers would be firing people left and right as opposed to learning how to work with them. And the final analogy is I don't think you or your viewers would be happy to think somebody who is in a wheelchair should be excluded from the setting because that wheelchair is going to be a big pain in the ass in that employer's job. That's a clear violation of disability act. And to frame it as kernel of truth, again, I think the big issue to keep in mind of kernel of truth is extrapolating um, from the population, perhaps in some interesting data, to the individuals. And the law, amongst everything else, now, again, you could say the law, may, maybe you should tell me whether you think the law is not a good idea. The law specifically says that Brits, Americans can't do this. Um. <sighs> That's that's probably a, a, an episode all of its own, Patrick. That I might be uh, maybe willing to hash out with you some other time. Um, I'd have to. You see, we again we spoke about this before we before we started recording. You see, I'm I'm a, a sort of political conservative, and so for me, any time the government starts sticking its big nose in things. There's, there always seems to be a, a huge downside for it. I think a lot of these issues can be taken care of at a, a community and a social level. Um, I'm not sure how, how far down this rabbit hole I want to go um, because... So you don't think protections for people with disabilities is a good idea? Again, I think it's something that's, that's better handled at a social level. Rather than if you know, rather than something being law, how do you separate the government from social? Well, I mean, you know, it's just for me, it's 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 minimal minimal government and letting things be dealt with at a more local level. I mean, you know, an example for me would be, you know, one of the big things at the moment is people talking about free speech and hate speech. 
and um, hate, spe- hate speech laws. And I'm, so I'm a free speech absolutist. I think if you want to be one of these idiots that goes around using racial slurs, you know, you should be free to do that. You know, short of, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theatre or, um, you know, calling for violence against somebody, um, then I'm a free speech absolutist because I just think that, you know, society and your local community deal with idiots like that. It's the same with the the issue to do with, you know, uh, there's been a few issues in America with um, cake shops that are refusing to bake cakes for for gay weddings and things and then they've been taken to to court for it and again for me it's you know if there's for me if there's a cake shop here that won't serve gay people that's that's prejudiced against gay people and there's a cake shop here that isn't prejudice well I'll go to this one and I think most people will go to this one and then this one can just go out of business and be dealt with in that sense and I think the same thing should be maybe dealt with 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 bosses if you've got some idiot that won't hire somebody because they're disabled then you know it's it'd be up to people at the community level to say don't go work for that idiot because because they're prick and yeah, but if all the bosses in a community won't hire a person with mental illness how does that person work but let, let, we'll try to get back to the topic at hand. I will share with you that I probably am a free speech absolutist as well. Um, there's been a movement at my university to try to keep the bad speakers out of the university. And I think bad ideas wilt in the light. So you and I are together on that. The big thing with the ADA is it requires a significant reimportionment of resources. So before the American Disabilities Act and whatever the counterpart in the UK, um, as a result of it, um, the private sector had to spend a lot of money to retool situations so people with wheelchairs could get around. And um, that's an expensive requirement. That would have never happened uh, spontaneously. I think the question is whether or not you would agree that was a bad requirement. Um, I don't think so. I think that's a necessary requirement. No, I mean, I'm, 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 you I'm, open that door to accommodations then you have the question of shouldn't there be similar accommodations for people with psychiatric disability? Yeah, no, yeah, that's no, that's a fair point. It's just you know, for me, it's any any sort of um, any sort of government compelling people to do things. Sort of, it makes me win. Some, I'm, I'm a bit. Can you come up with a community way to achieve these goals other than the government passing a disability act? Um, I think. You see, I think I think politics is downstream from culture. I think a lot of policy comes out of culture, the, the way culture moves. And, you know, I think like with the, the, the for the most part, the acceptance of, you know, of, uh, of gay people nowadays, it's, it's not so much because the, the government compelled it. It's because people just, people came to the senses. People got nicer. People became educated. And, and then maybe government policy followed on from that that it's just not acceptable to be prejudiced against somebody from for you know the 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 way they were made um but i don't know i think we're going down a bit of a uh, a rabbit mad, hole yeah a bit of a rabbit hole here patrick I just saw alice walk by <laughs> um okay let's let, let let's keep moving because i do want to get to the the that some of the main arguments in your book which i think is super important i mean i think if um, you know, what one of the things that we, we could agree on, even if we may be at opposite ends of the political spectrum, is we probably want the same outcomes for people, even if we see different ways of getting there. And um, again, there was some some stuff I read in your book about the what I would consider at least counterintuitive ideas about anti-stigma campaigns. And so I do I do want to get to that. Um, but the last the last thing I, I just want you to push up against um, is the the idea that stigma is only a problem because we keep going on about it that w- in 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 campaigning that there is stigma in mental health that's the thing that makes people twig that there's stigma and oh well maybe there's something to be worried about if there's if stigma's a problem um again i think you you know dj jaffe is says that he, i mean he wrote quite a, a popular article saying that um you know mental st- stigma in mental illness doesn't exist there's just prejudice and discrimination and the way that the way that uh, gay people and blacks and uh, like the the um i can't remember. I, I i won't paraphrase him because i can't i can't quote him sorry but um a lot of these 
previously stigmatized communities, the way they dealt with stigma was just saying, no one, there's no stigma. I, and, and saying stigma doesn't exist. I'm not, I'm not being a stigmatized person. You're not telling me that there's something wrong with me. So now all we have to deal with is your prejudice and your, your discrimination. And, and so in, in keep arguing that there's stigma and keep putting money into it and having anti-stigma campaigns, it's sort of perpetuating the problem. <laughs> wow. Um, so there was no stigma of mental illness until a handful of us started harping about it. Um, and racism's all taken care of, and there is no more sexism that um, women have all the same opportunities as everybody else. Well... I mean, the, the way you, the, I mean, the way you've put that back to me, I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, I can quote I can quote you exactly um, at, at something from one of DJ's articles if you'd like. To... I'm sure DJ Jaffe and I would come to blows if we were in the same room. Um, well, uh, I think he likes to use stuff in provocative ways to push an agenda that pretty much is trying to reintroduce um, a course of approach to treatment. I'm trying to push an agenda that pretty much trying to push empowerment of people with lived experience. And that may be a fundamental difference. We're probably both good at quoting data to support it. But I refuse to accept the idea that racism is gone <laughs> and that the only way reason it ever came about is some people like Martin Luther King brought it up. And I refuse to believe that the stigma of mental illness one day appeared when some people who had their own agenda, um, perhaps people like me who are making money off of selling books, are trying to sell this sort of thing. And if we stopped talking about it, it would go away. Well, yeah, I've just noticed, Patrick, to be fair, um, so I'm just looking at the quote now. In the article, DJ doesn't actually mention um, ethnic minorities. The people he mentions um, are gays, lesbians, and the left-handed. He says there's also uh, people with cancer, um, prostate cancer, breast cancer. Those were things that once upon a time uh, were stigmatized. And he says, but, you know, over time, these groups found a cure. They simply decided there was no stigma to having cancer, Um they killed stigma and recognised that what they were really suffering from was prejudice and discrimination. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, like I said, I was paraphrasing before. I don't know I don't... what the difference is between stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. I mean, the definition we went over before is stigma, sort of historical idea that's been parsed into and consistent with stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. I guess I, I think maybe what DJ's arguing is that you, instead of arguing about stigma in a sort of abstract way as, as an abstract concept is instead of dealing with that and talking about it uh, you know and people are stigmatized is is dealing with what's downstream from that and that's prejudice and discrimination so let's scrap the idea of stigma altogether and just deal with the 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 sort of the issue the problem was on the ground so to speak so fine I don't have to talk about the idea of stigma, <laughs> but people with mental illness still experience prejudice, are biased against, and discriminated against. And just because we stop saying the S word does not mean that's going to go away. And that you that he hailed the gay population for standing up and taking control, I agree with that entirely, is that people need to stand up and take control. But if he or anybody thinks that gay bias has gone away. Um, I love a thing I once heard in NPR when they were talking about gay marriage in Alabama. Try living in Alabama and being gay. I'm sorry, those things, we've made big steps, but those things have not gone away. Yeah, I guess, I, may, I mean, maybe one of the other things that he's probably arguing for, um, and again, I don't want to speak on his behalf. You know, I'd have to... I'd, that's one of my problems of being a, a generalist, Patrick, is that, you know, researching one thing one week and then a completely different thing another sure. week and so I forget things. But um, I guess maybe he, he might also be advocating for it. There's, there's a lot of campaigning that goes on, you know, a lot of, um, you know, social media campaigns and things like that where money's thrust into stigma campaigns, whereas a lot of that money could maybe be siphoned into actually, you know, into things like education and dealing with discrimination, at, you know, at a grassroots level. Maybe that's what he's arguing for. 
Um, but well, would education be a stigma campaign? I, don't, I wish I had him here now to argue his side of it. Um, but you know what, Patrick, we're going to run into this anyway now because let's let's jump into the 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 issue with anti-stigma campaigns. Um, and this was the you know of, of the all the things I was reading in your book. This was you know the the, the most eye-opening thing to me. Um, so, so let's make sure, okay. my, my friend, that we don't use what I have in this campaign to come to a conclusion and endorse what Mr. Jaffe says, which is that these campaigns are not needed. Uh, my point is that a lot of the campaigns aren't effective, but there is a fairly clear direction to go. Right. And so let me tell you why these campaigns get screwed up. Um, it's what the stigma effect is. The stigma, stigma um, is a clarion call to progressives. All these lefties who come around and say this is wrong and they want to go charging in to an arena to try to right the wrong. And probably the biggest aha moment from my research that your um, viewers will find interesting is that education approaches mostly don't work well to change stigma. Okay, so... Here we go. So if you could sort of quickly describe what an educational campaign would look like and then explain why it's not necessarily effective or maybe it's, you know, harmful. So an education program typically is challenging the myths of mental illness with the facts. So the myths of mental illness is people mental illness are dangerous. The fact is, is that the degree to which they're dangerous is grossly overestimated that it could be around the order of two or three percent. And if you go in a room with 100 people with mental illness, and you were to segregate and coerce um, that group because they had diagnosed of schizophrenia, you'd be wrong 97% of the time. That would be a myth versus a fact. Part of the issue is just the ongoing research, and our group did a meta-analysis a few years back. Part of the issue is purely um, education effects, if they work, don't maintain over time and don't work to the same degree to the alternative approach, which is contact. And so education approaches by themselves just don't have any big effects. Anecdotally, it might make sense. Um, there's something to be said for mental health literacy, for your viewers understanding that you're kind of sad and you can't get out of bed and you're not eating much. Oh, that's something called depression and here I can go get help. But, added, but knowledge doesn't change your views about an outgroup. Learning that black people, for example, come from a rich proud heritage in this other continent with all the accomplishments they had does not challenge stereotypes. Stereotypes tend to be resilient against that kind of information. And in terms of making it worse, probably the best example of making it worse is many anti-stigma campaigns about 20 years ago came out and said mental illness is a brain disorder. And actually that does change attitudes. I'm a lot less likely to blame somebody for their mental illness if I believe it's a brain disorder, but even more, I'm less likely to think they're going to get better. It's hardwired in. They're not going to recover. And the problem with that is an employer is less likely to hire somebody they believe is not going to recover. I mean, you look good now, but you could flip out at any minute. And so that kind of education actually makes stereotypes worse. What about the um, this in with various diagnoses, there's a sort of push for... For, for renaming schizophrenia is probably the most popular one that people are saying you know it it, it, it needs renaming and that's that points to um the you know I might, I might call it language policing but people would call it maybe you know linguistic modification or or something to that effect um and to be fair patrick i'd say that there's um I'm half I am half convinced by 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 some of that as well. Um, that changing the name would be good. Yeah, yeah, I'm, and you see, I'm, the one with schizophrenia is it's a very sort of besides the 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 immediate image that it conjures up, and it's one you know one that the the media is sort of guilty of uh, of perpetuating with with movies and things like that. Just sonically, it's a it's a very displeasing word to hear. It's a very sort of angular, sharp word. There's there's many facets to that particular word that make it make it sort of unpalatable, and and so part of me thinks that maybe a a, a change of that um, 
and there's been a, there's been a few few um, that have been proposed. I can't remember any off the top of my head. I don't know if you can. One of them is Bloiler's disorder. Yes, yes. Because Wigan Bloiler was a Swiss psychiatrist, the first guy who named the basics of schizophrenia. Right. So, on the face of it, that's that sounds quite convincing to me. But I'm I'll throw that back to you and see whether that's whether that's actually the case. You know, I wrote an entire chapter about that. I, I, um, I, do, I do, Patrick, but you're supposed to pretend like I don't already know this stuff. <laughs> oh, so you're setting me up. So, okay, yes, yours, <laughs> pretend you didn't hear what we just said. Um, so, um, it was a very popular movement afoot to, to change the stigma by changing the words. Um, we've done that. Dementia is now Alzheimer's disorder. Um, bipolar disorder was uh, mania. Um, in the United States, by act of Congress, mental retardation is no longer a word that's allowed in American legislation. It's intellectual disability. Be clear. I, I'm all for respecting people and not hurting them. But um, there are countries in the world, Japan being one of them, who specifically changed the word they use for schizophrenia to a different word. Um, unfortunately, I don't speak Japanese. I can't share it with you. But they've done research on that to see what kind of effect it has on the population. And it generally has two effects. On the general population, it tends to have no effect. I don't care what you call it. Schizophrenia, broiler's disorder, um, neurochemical disorder. You're still nuts and you scare me. It has a big effect on the provider population. And it's the provider population who tends to push this agenda. It has a big effect in the provider population. For example, when the DSM-5 came out, I assume your viewers know the DSM-5 is the Dictionary of Mental Illness. When DSM-5 came out a few years ago, we had cured Asperger's disorder because it got taken out of the DSM-5. So when they changed the words, I learned them really fast so that I could build. Um, I think on top of that, it has two unintended effects. One is it makes the whole thing look easy. So, you know, Mr. Jaffe's right. Why well, spend all these money on anti-stigma programs? Well, all you got to do is agree and change the words. And two is it leads to what we call word police. Word police is you get into this big fight of call it bipolar disorder, call it mania, call it really out of wacky disorder. I mean, there's some benefit in getting some consensus but, you know, do we want to spend all our time trying to change stigma with that battle? Because, you know, at the end of the day, <clears throat> I'm not trying to change your opinions or most of your listeners who are probably, I'm guessing, somewhat knowledgeable about the mental health campaign. I'm trying to change my Aunt Lillian's opinion about it. Right. Aunt Lillian didn't have a clue about this sort of stuff. And I get one shot at her. Don't want to use all my efforts and saying, you know, you should say boilers disorder instead of schizophrenia. I mean, it won't have any effect. Yeah, I get. I guess people maybe have a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a bad reaction to it as well. It's one of those things that people might get the the backs up about being told how to how to speak and what to say. And there's something something. Quite there's a smugness to it, mm. and the smugness just puts the whole thing to an end. I'll share something with you. In the United States, there's a group of people, including part of the government, who believes stigma is a stigmatizing term. And you should not use the word stigma because the word stigma somehow puts blame on people with mental illness. And some proponents of this view believe we don't use the word stigma about anybody else other than people with mental illness, which isn't true. I mean, actually, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the stigma of race. But the problem with the whole thing is if you and I start talking about stigma and I do this tut, 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 Danny, don't use that word stigma, then we spend all this time re-railing and every time you use the word you feel embarrassed and it just it just distracts us from more important points. Yeah, it does. It, put, it sort of puts you in a, um, an immediately antagonistic position to one another as well. And like you say, right. on, on a point that's not necessarily the... the, the, the a point that's not necessarily paramount, I guess. Um, finally, I'm gonna before I, I ask you to sort of lay out what would be the 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 best sort of uh, of anti stigma campaigns. Sort of maybe touching on on what we've just been talking about. Then is the idea of protest. Now, protesting seems it, it seems quite a common approach. There's and uh, there's quite a. There's a, a, a movement in the UK, definitely at the moment. I'm not sure if it's if it's 
so hot at the moment in in the US with uh, there's a there's an anti-diagnostic movement at the moment which really seems to be um picking up speed at the moment and some of the dialogue you see between people on social media is very antagonistic and you know people are people are you know really throwing the weight behind it and being activists and and saying you know I won't be fucking labeled I mean they're really serious about it and it's it's in the form of a protest and I'm just wondering what your opinion is of, of the, the the effectiveness of, of that approach. I think protest over the long term might have some effect on discrimination, but this is where the word stigma goes back. Um, if our goal is to get a group to stigmatize less, to believe that people with mental illness are not dangerous and not incompetent and not blithering idiots, getting in their face with a protest does not change attitudes. It might change behaviors. But it does not make them turn around and go, by Jove, you're right. Just like a minute ago, you agreed with me for me to tut tut you and embarrass you because you said the word stigma does not change your attitude. It might suppress your behavior. But by the way, your behavior will come back the minute you're back with other people who say stigma. Your behavior will come back the minute these MDs are back with other MDs who diagnose. Right. Yeah. I don't have any problem with them arguing, fighting, pushing for a social agenda. That's not going to decrease stigma. Right. So what is going to dec decrease stigma? So here we go. And this is where I'd like you to sort of lay out what you think would be sort of the, not necessarily the ideal anti-stigma campaigns, but maybe the, you know, the, the, the best way to spend time, especially the best way to spend money and resources. But I'm, I'm specifically going to ask you for examples that fit in with the, um, the three agendas that you lay out in the book. So if you could briefly mention what each of those agendas is and then attach uh, the, the most effective anti-stigma campaign to, to each of those. I think that's very... Now that's very. We're getting sort of very practical advice for anybody listening now that would be um, a proponent of any one of these agendas. So, so I said one of the insights I had over time is people change, go after stigma for separate reasons, and there are three agendas. And people in Mr. Jaffe's boat might go after stigma to try to decrease label avoidance. So again, remember, label avoidance is this issue that I'm not going to go get help because I don't want to be stigmatized. And I think Mr. Jaffe would agree if those people got help, you wouldn't have all the problems we have. So that's the services agenda. The agenda there is to convince people that going and getting help for your sickness is a good thing. And Beyond Blue in Australia is probably one of the largest, oldest examples of that. That is not consistent with the advocate's agenda. The advocate's agenda for mental illness is the exact same boat as the advocate's agenda for black people. Black people wanted white people to stop discriminating against them. They wanted them to be able to be hired, have economic possibilities, live where they wanted to live, go to the schools they want to go to school to. And so do people, advocates with mental illness. Their goal is not to decrease stigma so they can get their buddy to go get help. Their goal is to decrease stigma so they can get jobs and school opportunities and the like. Um, that's trying to deal with public stigma. And the issue I made in the book is that the first agenda and the second agenda can come head to head, which we showed in the study. If our goal is to try to get you to go see a doctor when you're sick, we push the idea that you're sick. And when you're sick, you can get better. And pushing a sick agenda pushes the idea of difference and therefore accentuates the public stigma. And so if you're sick and different than me, why as an employer am I going to want to hire you? Right. Um, the third agenda is the self-stigma. The agenda is that internalizing this stuff really makes you feel ashamed of yourself. And um, being in the closet is a horrible place for people to be. So you want to deal with stigma so people can be out, be out authentically with who they are. Just like a gay people, gay person can be out authentically with who they are. So how do you fix these agenda? 
I'm not sure there's a one-to-one -one correspondence as much as a big picture issue. Okay. And so the big picture issue is, again, if you want a, a, a metaphor that makes a lot of sense, look at the gay community and how did we improve attitudes about lesbians, gays, bisexuals. It's not by teaching my kids when they were in school that this was in, in health class, this was genetic, and they really don't have any control over it. It's a different opportunity. It's because 30, 40, 50 years ago, brave gay men and women came out. And when they came out, you realize they're a whole people. They're not different than I am. And it, it trumps any kind of individual piece of knowledge into a more holistic approach. So that by the time my kids got to school, they knew they had two gay uncles and a gay minister. And heck, in the United States, by the time they got to school, they had these rainbow flags everywhere and all their gay peers were out. It really suppressed the stigma. And so we would argue that's the same thing with mental illness. The way to tear down the stigma of mental illness is for the, the stigmatizing population to interact with other people who are in recovery from mental illness. And the issues I said before is you don't know who they are unless they come out. Yeah, I, I, one of the sort of immediate things that springs to mind there is that the the face to face interaction is not really it's not scalable in a way that all these other you know like a social media campaign is. Um, Bravo! That's what people come back and say all the time. Um, but again, look at the gay population. I mean, there may have been some. I don't know if I can ever remember gay public service announcements. A big thing that happened in the United States was Ellen DeGeneres came out on her TV show um, as gay, as lesbian. Um, yeah, but that, it, was, it, that was a big deal back in the day, wasn't it? Oh, that was a big deal, yeah. right? That was that. Uh, people still cite that. Um, but I think the monumental change in gays, which, by the way, might show the difference between urban and rural places is the degree to which I now know I work in the office next to me with a gay guy. And um, as I said, my brother-in-law is gay and my minister is gay. And, you know, when you interact with people, it does two things. Right away, it suppresses the bigotry. Because if I'm a mental, if I'm a gay bigot, I'm still not going to be stupid enough at work to just let it fly. But it also allows you to see what it means to be human in a much broader sense. And so I think what really changed the anti-gay agenda here is the degree to which we can actually interact with peers, with people that are gay, because they had guts and came out. And I think it applies similarly to people with mental illness. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I will testify to that, Pat, by saying um, back, you know, all my listeners already know this, but back in back in 2014 when I was sort of at the, or getting to the, the, the heights or the, the, the depths of my despair, um, I founded a, a mental health support group. And it was for, it was mainly for people with, like, anxiety, depression. But then people with that would come along and they would say that they, they had schizophrenia or they'd suffer, had a psychotic episode. And I'll admit, when I sat next to these people, it wasn't... When they told me this, it wasn't like I thought, oh, my God, you know, you're going to stab me to death or anything. But it... It it made it made me uncomfortable. I I, I don't know if I, what I, I, if it was I felt that there was I don't know there was some threat there. I I genuinely don't know what it was or whether it was just I didn't know whether you're supposed to talk to these people differently or anything like that. But then you know after running the the group for for three years, it just you know any any and all of that just completely fell away. And, and and to be fair as well, it didn't take three years. You know, it was it three years was the duration I was running the, the the support group for. But you know, after meeting a few people and going, oh shit, you're you're completely normal. How you know how interesting? What a revelation. Um, so yeah, I I would agree that um, you know, and I'm not I'm not a, a prejudicial person. For all I'll I'll shout about my conservatism. Socially, I'm very liberal, and you know, but. Yeah, even the the schizophrenia label even even made me prickle a little bit, but like I say, I overcame it very quickly. I sort of feel uncomfortable admitting that, to be honest. But um, yeah, I will you know I will testify to the, the the effectiveness of it. But the problem that that raises then, Pat, is like you were saying, you, you the, the, these people that originally come out and say, you know, bollocks to it, yeah, like I'm gay and what, 
do you think it's analogous for somebody with, with with serious mental illness to do that? Maybe the consequences are different. There's something different at stake, and you know, is is it is it a reasonable expectation to have of people, or is it just something that we hope you can only hope grows organically? Um, well, the way you're framing it, um, then we should go back in the time machine and tell gay people not to come out. Because the risks of coming out gay in the United States were a lot bigger than the risks of coming out mentally ill. Hmm. Um, you know Matthew Shepard? Matthew Shepard was a gay young man who was tied to a fence in Wyoming and beaten to death and set on fire. Is The violence against gay people was huge. Um, you see all sorts of discrimination against people with mental illness and violence once in a while, but not to the degree, not to the danger of coming out gay. And so would we have said 40 or 50 years ago, you should come out? Um, I would have said it's pretty risky. Um, I don't know what you're going to get out of it. In retro in 50 years later, I see, well, it really was a smart move mm -hmm. because now, I mean, again, I think, I, I don't think um, homophobia has gone away. I think no. um, they made big strides, and I think that's because um, gay men and women came out. I would just argue you can't do it naively. Um, if you come out with mental illness, there are risks, and you need to decide. You need to identify what the pros and cons are, and given those, how you're going to deal with it. And so, as you know. We, over the last 10 years, have developed a program called Honest, Open, Proud, um, which if um, your viewers Google it, um, they can find it and download it for free. It's a strategic three-lesson group where people decide the pros and cons of coming out. Um, second, if they are going to come out, how to do it strategically. For example, you, Danny, seem to be a nice guy. I could take you to the local coffee shop and say, hey, did you see the recent movie by... Um, called uh, Silver Linings Playbook. What did you think? And if you said, I'm sick and tired of those wacko people like that, I know you're not a good guy to come out to. Right. And then the third one, it's my story. What am I going to say? I think strategic disclosure is, is the way to change the impact of stigma. And I think it has a twofold impact. One is being in the closet is horrible for people. And you can gain some control. Again, Make sure everybody hears. I'm not saying be naive about it. Again, there's a lot of stigma out there. I wouldn't say today, go tell your boss, big news, I had mania, and expect everything to be fine. Um, but knowing you can have control over your story and who you can tell, it can have a big influence. And then the second thing is that's what's going to change public stigma, the prejudice, the discrimination. That's what's going to change the label avoidance is because all these people are out, the, the battalion of people that are out, are huge. And you talked about scaling up. Um, you know, as I said before, you always have to be suspicious of statistics, but statistics suggest the gay population's about 10% of the population. Well, about 25% of the adult population will meet criteria for serious mental illness in their lifetime. So there's a lot more of us than there are of them. And if we started coming out, it would have a huge impact. So finally, what do you... Looking back over your career, since the beginning of your career, what what big changes have you seen, if any, and what would you mainly attribute them to? The grassroots is getting a lot louder, and they're noticed more, um, and I think that's great. Um, I think um, this whole thing should be led by people with lived experience, uh, and I think the rest of us, if we don't have lived experience, we're allies. Um, I'm a straight man. Um, if my child came home and said they, they were gay, uh, that that young man and his friends would lead the agenda, but I would be an ally and step behind him in solidarity 100%. I think we're beginning to do that, and I think that's good. Right, okay, Patrick. So I think I think we've given people plenty to, to, to sort of chew on there. Um, and would you would you say that this book is for um, a lay audience, or would you recommend it more for, for researchers? So I've written 17 books. Um, 15 of them I would never show my mother. Um, this book is written for lay audiences. Yeah, I've, I've got to say as well, it's it's um, 
it's not just, even though it's, it's you know, a, the stigma effect, the unintended consequences of mental health campaigns, it actually works as a, a pretty good introduction to the entire concept uh, of, uh, of mental health stigma as well. So, yeah, I'd definitely recommend that for, for, for anybody that's interested. Um, but before we jump into the quickfire questions, Pat, um, I think you mentioned a few before. If you'd just like to give the listeners um, any links, social media, websites, any other books, anything like that you'd like to, to direct the, the listeners towards? So The Stigma Effect's been out since October by Columbia University Press. You can get it at Amazon. Um, websites, probably the best one is where the HOP program can be uh, found as well as the research that supports it. HOP is Honest, Open, Proud. The website's www.hopprogram.org. Right, okay. And um, I've, I've, I have to say, Pat, I've not looked at that myself, but I, I, I quite like the sound of that because it's ve very much in line with a lot of the stuff that um, Graham Thornacroft recommended on his um, interview with me. But now that, you know, the idea that it's written down somewhere and a bit more structural, um, I quite like the idea of that. So as always, I will include all the links to, to, to those in the show notes, um, Pat's book, and uh, any other any other links can find any interesting information uh, for people to check out. Um, so anyway, let's jump into the quick fire questions. As usual, folks, you do get the first one free, but then after that, you have to pay, help me pay these ever increasing <laughs> um, hosting bills. Um, and you can do that by going to Patreon, um, where we've got you know a load of extra material and uh, you know blog posts and audio, quick fire questions, all sorts of of extra stuff there. Um, that's for as little as two dollars a month. Um, it's patreon.com forward slash my own worst enemy. Um, okay, let's jump into these. So, Pat, what is the last book you read and then the best book you've ever read? So the last book I read is the one I'm reading now, which we'll share with everybody, Guilty Pleasures. I'm a Stephen King um, fan. I think his most recent one just came out. It's called Apt Pupil. Um, the best books, that's a tough question, but one I keep going back to is a book of aphorisms um, by a Taoist uh, monk. Um, Taoism really speaks to me, and so if things get a little tough, I'll open up the aphorism for the day. All right, quite spontaneous, but is it what, what aphorism, first aphorism that sort of springs to mind? Um, wisdom lies in the ordinary. Oh, go on. C can you just elaborate on that a little bit? That hasn't landed for me. Help, help that land for me. Okay. I'll, um, so anybody who's into Taoism is going to poo-poo me. <laughs> um, I think, to me, the idea of Taoism is that the God, the spiritual, lies in what's right in front of us, um, not in images or esoteric ideas. So I love to, for example, um, walk to work and marvel at the degree to which all these different machines and people can interact and not run into each other and kill each other. Yes. That, to me, is sort of an example of the Tao. Right, okay. I quite like that. I'll have to, I'll have to mull, mull that one over a little bit. Okay, this will be an interesting one. If you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy or policies uh, would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public.